Hello, this is Professor Paul, and this lecture is on analyzing a debate, how to understand the way different perspectives and positions in the debate are articulated, and how to write about that relationship. So this is all in support of the essay that's due on April 22nd, where I'm asking you to provide an analysis of the debate surrounding the topic that you're researching. So what I want you to do in this assignment is to present an objective, unbiased, and neutral presentation of the different perspectives on your topic. So regarding the question of blank, whatever your research topic might be, your research question, the issue that you're trying to answer, the problem that you're trying to solve, you're going to discuss how group A, whoever that is, argue that blah blah blah, what their position is, Group B argues that blah, 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 what their position is. And so you're reporting on what others argue. You're not stating your position in this essay. This isn't about your argument, but just about what each side believes. So the goal is to be as, again, objective, unbiased, and positive, present both sides in the best light possible. So the first step is to go back and review your research question. And it's always helpful when you're looking at this again to see if you can refine your language a little bit. So as we talked about a few weeks ago, you've tried to frame this in something, some sort of statement such as, I am studying the topic of blank because I want to know the answer to a certain question in order to help my readers understand how they should respond or what they should think about a particular phenomenon or topic. So ask yourself, what's the phenomenon you wish to understand? What's the problem you're trying to solve? So it could be, I am studying the topic of the economic effects of the minimum wage because I want to know whether or not raising the minimum wage will cause an economic, uh, will have economic benefits in order to help my readers understand what policies they should support regarding what economic policies they should support and what they should propose to their representatives. So reviewing that because of course it's the answer to that, it's how the different sources answer that, that makes up the body of this paper. That each side has their own answer to the question and policy or purpose that they're trying to propose. So for the purposes of this lecture, I've gone ahead and come up with a research project of the future. Imagine a hundred years from now, we've created super intelligent robots, and there's been a movement to give robots equal rights, to pass a constitutional amendment to give robots equal rights under the U.S. Uh, government. So let's say you were researching this project in the future, you're a student in the year 2117, and so you write down your topic, something like, I am studying the topic of robot intelligence because I want to know if robots are capable of human emotion in order to help my readers decide if they should support a constitutional amendment to give robots equal rights. So that's the example that we're going to use, and we'll come back to this as we go through the different steps. Now that you know the question that you're trying to answer, you want to identify what the different positions are regarding this topic. How have the experts and the others interested in this topic, those people who you've researched, the sources that you've read, how do they answer this question? And it's helpful to see if there is a clear for or against division among the experts and other interested parties. In some topics, especially particularly controversial ones, there's a clear for or against division. In other topics, however, might not be a clear op opposition. It might just be a difference of emphasis or focus. So if there's not a clear for or against, pro, con, yes, no, what are the other issues that differentiate between the perspectives of your sources? What are the other things that uh, divide them? What are the main principles that you can group them on? If it's not a yes or no, it's this person focuses on aspect A, this other group focuses on aspect B. So look for what the main positions are. And usually if you can identify two main positions, that's the goal in an exercise like this. Often there'll be more than two positions, even for very controversial subjects, but for our purposes, we're really thinking about the two sort of major alternatives to your topic. 
And so you might try to frame it in this way for yourself and in the paper. In response to the issue of blank, whatever the topic is, group A or group B, whatever they are, and you might give them a better name than group A or group B, argues that blank, that's their answer to the question, to the question you're trying to answer. And so they support blank, whatever their goal or proposal or purpose might be. So for example, in response to the issue of minimum wage, group A argues that uh, there's or there are some supporters that argue that raising the minimum wage will have an overall beneficial effect on the economy and so they support passing a federal law to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. The more specific you can be, the better because it's not just necessarily even going to be pro-con, um, it's what do they want to do. So if you're researching a topic like gun control, it's not just that some people don't want gun control and some people do want gun control, it's what's the specific kinds of gun control that the one side uh, is pushing for, what are the specific kinds of gun control that the other side is resisting, et cetera, et cetera. So the more precise you can be about the particular goals and their particular answers, the better. So to go to the example that we're looking at, research project of the future, should robots have equal rights? There are, let's say we've found two main positions in our sources. Those who support a constitutional amendment to give equal rights to robots, we're going to call them Group A, and those who oppose a constitutional amendment to give equal rights to robots, Group B. And we'll also say that there are other sources that we possibly found, things that might discuss robot intelligence or legal issues about human rights, constitutional amendments, things like that, but that don't directly address this topic or the question of rights with, in relation to robots. So there might be other material that we can use and that we might need to reference in this paper. So given those two different sides, two major sides, we could phrase a statement something like this. Within the debate on robots' rights, one group of scientists, legal scholars, and philosophers argues that robots demonstrate significant evidence of human emotions, and that because of this evidence, we have a moral and ethical duty to grant equal rights to robots. So notice how in the first underlined section, it identifies the topic that we're investigating. The second underlined one identifies the specific group rather than just group A. It says who makes up group A. It, the third one summarizes their answer to the question, do robots have human emotions? This group says, yes, they do. And it summarizes their goal, says, what do they want to do? What do they think is the proper course of action, given uh, what they think? And we can imagine doing writing a similar sentence for the other side. Right. And we wouldn't necessarily need to make both sentences quite this elaborate, but it's very useful to do so in the note-taking process, in the drafting process, because then you've clarified for yourself the ideas and how each side, um, what each side's basic argument is and how they relate to your research topic. So it's going to enable you in a much easier way to organize them in relationship to each other and show how each one develops their argument. Step three, organize your sources. Really, step three is simultaneous with step two because you can't identify what the different perspectives are until you've looked at your sources and said, well, this group believes X and this other group believes Y. And in the process of organizing your sources and dividing them into group A and group B, you have to consider what are the factors that they have in common, what makes all of these part of group A, what makes all of these other articles part of group B. Um, and in doing so, you're also, of course, going to identify the sources that are neutral or provide useful information that relates to the topic, but not the specific question. So, for example, if there's just a historical article that gives important background or something like that, that would be a neutral source that is not necessarily, uh, that doesn't have a specific agenda for one side or the other. So going back to our fictionalized research project, should robots have equal rights? We've organized our sources, and so I've grouped our four articles that are pro-robots rights here on this slide. And we also have a group of scholars that have written against robot rights. And here are those four so sources that we've got. And finally, let's imagine that we've also found a couple of sources that are 
related to the topic that have information about this issue, but they don't directly answer the question or propose an answer to the question of robots and equal rights, so we might use these for other background information. Once you've organized your sources into the different groups, now you want to go through and examine each perspective looking at the details. Now ideally, all this information that you're looking for is stuff that you've already found and written about in your annotated bibliography. This is why that is such an important assignment, because it allows you to find all this information that then you can very easily organize for whatever your purposes are as you're making your argument. So for each group, the first thing you want to do is identify the thesis of each source. What is their primary argument? What are they arguing and what is their purpose or proposal? And this is important because even though they might be on the same side, right, with their, we've got four different art authors that are arguing for robots rights, for example, they might be making different arguments in favor of robots rights. One might be making a legal argument, one might be making an economic argument, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they might have different purposes or goals that they want to achieve. One might explicitly be pushing for legal action. Another one might be encouraging not necessarily legal action or, or a law to be passed, but a more sort of informal uh, social acceptance, something like that. So understanding how even within the same side the perspectives are different and the arguments are different is essential for you to be able to understand the perspective as a whole. So once you've identified the main argument of each source, you want to look at the different reasons that they're using to support their position. What kinds of arguments are they making? What topics are they bringing up? What issues are they addressing? And this, of course, is going to go hand in hand with the evidence that each source is using. How are they proving their point? Do they have statistics, anecdotes, textual citations, expert authority? what sort of information is being presented. And this can be in a number of different forms. And again, different sources are going to provide different types of information, and they're going to make their case in distinct ways. Finally, you want to integrate all this information. So you found the thesis, the reasons, the evidence that each individual source is making on side A, on side B, and then you want to see how do the different sources on side A, on side B, work together. How can you make them talk to each other, so to speak? So you start looking for connections, patterns, repetitions, complementary or contradictory ideas, anything that connects the sources to each other. And this is going to be very important when we start thinking about how to organize the paper itself and writing the paper. So do any of the sources cite each other? Is one of your sources citing someone else? That's obviously important because they're probably going to be, want to be discussed together in your paper. Do any of the sources make similar arguments or use similar evidence to each other? Because then they'll be grouped together. If you've got two different sources on the same side that are both making economic arguments or that are both making legal arguments, that's going to be important to talk about them together. Or they might be using the same evidence to come to different conclusions um, or, or using the same evidence to support different reasonings. That's also going to be important because you'll want to indicate that connection. And then finally, could the ideas or evidence in, in one source complement the ideas in another? So, for example, if one person is making uh, an economic argument, but they don't talk about one particular phenomenon or, or event, and then another source mentions that phenomenon or event, how might that evidence be used to bolster, strengthen the argument in another source? And, of course, also you can think about how the evidence in one source might contradict the evidence in another source, but more important for our purposes is making those positive connections. How do they work together to create the overall perspective of the people on side A or side B? So let's go to our fictional research project on robots and equal rights to imagine how we might go through this process of identifying the main argument of each of our sources and then integrating the different ideas on one side together. Uh, and of course, these are all fictional articles, uh, so everything, all the details here are made up. I've just imagined what someone might write if this were a real debate. 
Um, and we're just going to go through group A, just the one side for purposes of illustration. So we have our first article, The Economic Exploitation of Robots by Ursula Asimov. Her thesis is that robots form an integral part of the economy. They contribute to our economy, but they don't benefit from it, and thus they deserve the same rights as any other workers. They deserve to benefit from their labor. And so what are the reasons and evidence that this person argues? They make various economic arguments. They talk about, uh, they show statistics on the growth of the economy, the contribution of robots to economic growth, et cetera, et cetera. They compare it to the status of low-wage workers and workers' rights movements in the past. They talk about business law and ethics, all sorts of issues like that. And that's the argument they make. Those are the kinds of evidence that they use to support their point. Our next source by Albert Zebra, More Than Metal, The Life of Unit X34. In this article, the person's, uh, Albert's thesis is that the life and experiences of Unit X34 demonstrate that robots can have the same emotional capabilities as humans and thus deserve the same rights. And so what's the reasoning and evidence that this person provides? They relate the life history of Unit X34 a robot that worked for a family over a few generations. They interview the robot, they interview family members, friends, and so they, through these stories, they demonstrate how the robot was not just a tool, not just a machine, but developed emotional bonds with the humans, appeared to experience happiness, sadness, etc., etc. So it's painting this, the picture of one individual's life. This is a, what we would call an anecdotal evidence because it's not something that can be generalized. It's not a, a, a mass of data. The sample size is only one individual, so it's not something that can be universalized. But through the depth of the analysis of this single experience, the idea is we learn things that could possibly be extrapolated, deep principles and ideas that could be extrapolated to other situations. Our third article, Enid Jackson, art, uh, in the Dutch slave trade, and robotics manufacturing, an analysis of historical and cultural similarities. The title pretty much tells us what this person's doing. And Jackson's thesis is that the modern robotics industry works in a similar way as the slave trade of the 17th and 18th century, and it perpetuates similar abuses. So in order to end those violations, uh, we would need to institute robot rights in the same way that slavery was eventually outlawed and uh, rights extended to uh, former slaves and the descendants of slaves. And so the evidence that a person in writing this sort of article would write would be historical evidence, obviously. This could be in the form of texts, records, all sorts of uh, archival material that compare the economic conditions, business practices, and goals of the Dutch slave trade to the modern robotics industry. So it's a historical example, a historical comparison that's going to look at the operations of two industries. And finally, our fourth article, Kevin Lee and Wilfred Simmons, Advances in Robotic Emotions. Their thesis is that advances in AI programming and robotics technology have come to the point where robots seem to display complex human emotions. And even if we don't know whether or not they are experiencing these emotions, because we can't necessarily get inside their head, so to speak, the only ethical response is to treat them as humans. If they appear to behave as humans, then we must ethically treat them as humans. And their reasons and evidence are they explain the development of robotics technology, they provide a history of that, they interpret the results of studies of robotic uh, emotional response, and they discuss the philosophical and ethical issues around um, the issue of equal rights and the display of, of human emotions. So this is their argument and their support. Now that we've gone through our annotated bibliography and identified what are the main points, the main ideas advanced by each of the sources, now we start looking for connections. Because what we don't want to do is just give a list of things in the, in the essay. We want to show how the perspective works, how the different sources relate to each other. So we would ask ourselves, do any of the sources make similar arguments or discuss related issues? Well, both Asimov and Jackson are talking about economic issues. Both Zebra and Lee talk about emotions. Both Jackson and Lee, in different ways, provide historical background. 
Both Asimov and Lee talk specifically about ethical issues, and we can see that the others do as well. But this is just some initial connections we can see about how the sources are related to each other based on the topics that they argue for. And this is going to be a much more powerful way of organizing our paper, because rather than saying Asimov says this and Jackson says this, we can say one common argument that is made is an economic argument that we see advanced in different ways by both Asimov and Jackson, who say blah, 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 blah. We'll get more into that in a few slides, though. Another part of looking for connections is seeing, could the ideas from one source help to support the arguments in another? Well, the arguments that Lee makes about how advances in AI technology have given robots the appearance of human emotions could help to explain or support the story that Albert Zebra tells about the one particular robot. And vice versa, his story could provide an example of Lee's arguments in action. So that's an important connection to make. Jackson's arguments, the historical arguments about uh, the comparison of robotics industry to the slave trade, could support Asimov's claims of economic exploitation of robots in contemporary world. And both Asimov and Lee make ethical arguments that seem to raise similar points that are based on similar principles, moral and ethical principles. So there's a connection there. So this, again, allows us to see not just how each individual author argues for some perspective, but how the perspective as a whole can be created through and uh, encompasses all these different types of arguments. And they're all needed. They're all part of an overall idea. That is, in this case, pro-robots rights. So now we get into the process of, organize, of the organized analysis of each perspective. We want to present the arguments for each side in a clear, logical manner. So we ask ourselves, what are the major issues, topics, subjects that come up again over and over again throughout all the authors on each perspective, on each side? And then how can you arrange those topics in a way so that your reader understands not just what each individual article is saying, but how the perspective as a whole takes shape. And you want to decide what's the most significant evidence that's provided by each side, because that's the evidence that you're going to cite, that you're going to reference in your analysis of the perspective. There are two main options for how to organize your analysis of each perspective. One is to go source by source, which, as I've been saying, is not really the preferred way of doing so. But let's look at what that would what that would mean. This is where you discuss each source individually, and you arrange them by chronology or perhaps alphabetically or some other principle. You go from one source to the next to the next. And so how would that look on the page? Well, it would have to be something like Ursula Asimov argues for robots rights because blah, 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 blah. Albert Zebra also argues for robots' rights. He says, blah, 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 blah. Another supporter of robot rights is Enid Jackson, who argues, blah, blah, blah. So what's the problem with this format? Well, it should be somewhat obvious, at least. Uh, besides arguing for or against some perspective, what do these authors really have in common? All you know is that each is arguing for robots' rights, but we don't see any connections between them or how they're related to each other. So it obscures the connections and patterns between them. Each source seems isolated to be making a solo case as opposed to part of an ongoing conversation. And it makes it very difficult to understand the overall argument because, again, how is it that this one argument, this one story about an individual robot relates at all to this historical comparison, I have no idea because I'm just looking at the sources in isolation. And also, just to read it, it's a very repetitive pattern and there's no transitions from paragraph to paragraph or section to section. It's just, here's one thing, here's another thing, here's another thing. So it's very boring to read and most likely boring to write. Option two, which is the much better option, is to organize the ideas that connect the sources. So those topics, those things that they have in common, you use those as the principles to organize your sources rather than just going source by source. So how would this look on the page? 
something like this. Supporters of robots' rights are motivated by ethical concerns. That's our first topic. For example, Asimov and Lee both argue that the ethics of human equality apply to robots because blah, 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 blah. And then you would go on to maybe specify some details from both Asimov and Lee's arguments and explain how they're both related, despite their differences, to ethics. And then the next paragraph, or a few paragraphs down, you might get to the question of ethics leads some supporters of robots' rights to examine the economic practices of robotics industry. Both Jackson and Asimov address different aspects of this topic, blah, 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 blah. You can talk about their differences, but how both of them are concerned with economics because of their interest in ethics. Others who argue for robots' rights focus not on economics, but on the emotional and psychological nature of robots. Lee's historical study argues that, blah, 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 blah. And then the arguments that Lee makes through his survey of scientific experiments are given a vivid demonstration in Zebra's personal history of X34, blah, 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 blah. So you can see that what we're doing here is, although there is some separation of the sources, they're being connected by the ideas that they have in common, by the ideas that are important to them and that define them as being on one side or another. Now, what are the strengths of option two? Well, first, it focuses on the argument and not on the individual sources. Because while the authors are important in the sense that they're the ones making the argument and you want to make sure that your authors are reliable, credible experts, ultimately, it's not about who says it, it's about what's being said. So we want to focus on the argument that's being made, not on the fact that it was made by a certain individual in a certain article. And this creates connections between the sources, connections that may not be there in the sources themselves, because, of course, they are not necessarily aware of all the other arguments that are being made. So it creates connections that show how this perspective is unified and how it can be uh, uh, created from a number of different ideas, a number of different sources, how it takes in all sorts of different um, disciplines, arguments, etc. It also leads to meaningful transitions between ideas. It shows us how one question leads to another. So, for example, we saw how people who are interested in ethics would then start questioning the issue of economics because they're looking at how are these people being treated economically. So this shows us the connections between the different types of ideas and also shows that it's a conversation. It's not just one person writing an article in isolation or a number of people writing these isolated articles, but it's part of an ongoing debate, an ongoing development. And finally, it demonstrates your understanding of the topic. It demonstrates that you know what you're talking about because you can say how the people on the different, in the different perspectives are uh, related to each other. So you understand the topic as opposed to just knowing, well, this person said this, this person said that, that person said that. That's not really understanding. That's just being able to regurgitate information. So now we're into step six, which is where we organize and write the paper. Um, and really, we've been writing the paper all along in this information that we've been gathering and the way we've been arranging it. Now it's just a matter of putting down the specifics and fleshing out the details, fleshing out the ideas that we've just outlined in brief so far. So. Part one of your paper is going to be the introduction, and this is where you'd identify what's the topic or problem that you're researching. And then you identify as well, what are the main perspectives or responses to the problem? Regarding the subject of robots' rights, there's one group that argues for this, there's another group that argues for this. So this is where that would go in your introductory paragraph or paragraphs. Part two is where you talk about the background to the problem. And again, this might be a paragraph or two you define, again, the problem in a little bit more detail. The introduction is, again, an introduction. It's where you get your reader interested in the topic and you outline the basic issues. This is where you go into more detail of saying, this is the history of the problem, if there's a need to talk about historical background, if there's any specialized terms that are used, for example, what is artificial intelligence, what are robots, et cetera, et cetera, anything like that that's particular to your research project. You identify the stakes of the problem from each perspective. So it, what does one side think uh, 
What does each side think will happen if the wrong choice is made? Why is this issue important to them? Why do they care about it? And this background is a good place for using neutral sources, those sources that aren't addressing the question itself in a yes or no way, but that give you information that can help you understand the topic. So like this is where we would talk about if there's an article going back to our sample, uh, our example story, the article about the history of AI or articles about constitutional law would go here. So this is the first two parts of your paper where you're outlining the problem and the perspectives in detail. So looking at our fictional research project, the introduction would do what? It would explain the question of robots' rights and why it's current. It explain that there's this debate and that there's, in this case, a constitutional amendment being proposed. And it would identify the two positions with a brief summation of their position. Those who support robots' rights believe it's a moral and ethical issue, while those who oppose the constitutional amendment believe that the scientific evidence does not support setting a potentially dangerous legal precedent. So that's just a brief summary in one sentence of what each side believes. And you'll go into more detail later on in the paper. Part one would explain in more detail the specific issue at hand, right? The actual uh, proposals that are being made, the rights that robots have or don't have. It would outline the history of AI and robotics development. It would outline the history of the robot rights debate. It would define any special scientific or legal terms. Again, AI, robotics, human rights, what do these things actually mean? Uh, because we might say human rights, but in a, that has a specific meaning in a legal or constitutional context as opposed to an everyday conversational context. And it would explain why each side finds the issue important. That is, what do they think is at stake if the wrong decision is made? Well, one side believes that it will be um, a moral failure on our part, we'll be abusing people, and the other side thinks that it could upset our legal system uh, based on uh, and that could possibly cause all sorts of legal and, and environmental and economic problems down the road. So this is the beginning of how your paper would work. Parts three and four of the paper, this is where you give the analysis of each perspective. Part three would be group A, part four would be group B. And I'm not gonna give you a sample of this because I've already done that um, a few slides back. But again, this is where you discuss the arguments that are made by group A, and then you discuss the arguments that are made by group B. Um, you organize via topics rather than sources, as I showed for a couple slides ago. You want to begin with the most important and or common ideas. What are the most foundational ideas? So in that example, I began with the ethical question, since that seemed to be the root of the argument. And then all the various ways in which that ethical uh, claim is developed through economics, through history, through scientific evidence, etc. So you begin with the most important and or common ideas, you include the most important evidence, and you highlight the connections between the sources. So again, I won't show you a sample of this since I've already done that, but this is the main part of the paper itself. Part five, the final part of the paper, this is your evaluation and conclusion. So you want to assess the relative strengths and weaknesses of each side and the nature of the debate as a whole. So what are the most persuasive aspects of each side? What's important about the argument that it makes? So here you want to try to see each side in its most positive light. What do we really learn from each side? And then what is missing or ignored by each side? What topics do they fail to address that they should? And so here you want to think about what would strengthen the argument if they had that there. What do they not have that they could use to strengthen their argument? As well as things that are obviously missing that they need. And then finally, what areas of common ground do the different perspectives share? Where could they, there be grounds for further productive conversation? Are there things that they agree on, principles that they agree on? Or are there issues that, if they investigated, might bring them closer together on this topic? So how might this look on the page? Well, let's again go to our fictional research project. And so let's review what we might have over in like this lecture. The debate First, on the robot's rights is an objective issues, presentation blah, blah, blah. So of the perspectives overall sort of on this issue. Summary so of the debate and answer the question, reiterating not how in different terms some of the ideas and that not which side you agree with. 
I should be unable to tell highlighting which side the main of this points, you agree with if you're on side A or side B side, because they both should those be presented support robots equally. Right, stress the importance of promoting so you want to identify value. and organize your However, sources by respective evidence who's on side A who's complete. on side so B who saying provides both what background really information about their otherwise perspective on the but question. what is possibly missing what you want to understand in depth the arguments those who challenge the proposed what's amendment the, what's their Urge thesis what is their during actions reasoning that evidence change society and this is why Still, that they are unable to think is a great resource that for you because you've got that information occur. already there so again you can go what it to is that, that they and just what their main idea is to help you understand the importance what of that why saying. it is and then you can use that to their make connections and between the sources you want to integrate them their argument integrate those sources that have shared ethical values of those common on approaches sides and their similar common reliance on scientific so studies of robot intelligence between the offer possibilities on each side. for future discussion. so that when you're writing the your paper you organize via advances. topics so the not common via ground that they have offers. where we could go you're next. saying how this, uh, these are the these ideas that they have in sides common can be put how the in conversation with each not other in author order a says to this, solve author the issues in order this. to answer the question and finally when looking at the overall paper how is it organized first you define the problem then you present each perspective, side A, side B, and then you evaluate, give an overview of the debate as a whole and what the strengths and weaknesses are of each side, what their common ground is, etc. So hopefully by following these guidelines, using this advice, this will help you to produce your own analysis of the debate, your own uh, effective uh, analysis of side A and side B, and by understanding how each side makes their argument, then this will enable you in the final paper to make your own case, to decide, to decide which view you want to propose and why you think that view is stronger than the others.